This is a NAS from Ugreen. And if you're not aware, Ugreen is a company most known for making cables, chargers, USB adapters, and other accessories, so the fact that they're making a NAS is a bit strange. This new lineup of NAS products from Ugreen has caused quite a stir it seems, and it kind of makes sense why. First of all, this thing looks great, and the lineup seems to be packed with some really great specs and features, and a reasonable price tag. So in this video, we're going to check this thing out and see if it's an absolute game changer, a complete flop, or more likely somewhere in between. Let's get started. Now obviously, if you're watching this video, you're probably interested in securely storing your data in a NAS like this one, and that's a great idea in my opinion. But the internet as a whole can be a bit of a wild place and frankly kind of scary. For example, have you ever just googled your name? It can be a bit unsettling seeing just how much of your personal info pops up. But that's just one of many reasons why I'm using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. As a YouTuber, I'm pretty cautious about how much of my personal information is just floating around on the internet, and Aura is kind of like a complete tool belt of resources I can use to help minimize that. For example, it's pretty common for data brokers to sell your information to scammers, spammers, and even more nefarious individuals. But Aura shows which brokers are selling that info, and then automatically submits opt-out requests, helping to keep my name, home address, and even things like health records out of sketchy hands. But Aura does so much more than just deal with data brokers. I get features like a VPN, password manager, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and a helpful browser plugin that does things like block malicious ads and trackers. Now, knowing you guys, you already use one, if not multiple, of these tools, but with Aura, it's nice that it's bundled up into just one service, one app, all at a pretty affordable price. So if you value your privacy or your family's privacy, and you want to check out all of the amazing features Aura provides, you can go to aura.com slash hardwarehaven for a free two-week trial. Seriously guys, there are a lot of helpful features and I think you'll find it valuable. So go click that link, I'll have it down in the description, and start your free two-week trial today. Alright, now let's talk about this guy. This piqued my curiosity for a number of reasons. First of all, Ugreen is completely new to the space, and not just NAS appliances, but computers in general but they do have years of experience of bringing products to market, so I was curious to see what all they could come up with. I'm also interested because I just love seeing new players come into this NAS space. On this channel, I love to talk about DIY, home servers, and storage and such, but having good options for new, sleek, and especially compact systems is great as well. And also, at least at face value, these look really compelling. Now before we dig too far into this, I have a couple things to mention. First of all, Ugreen is using Kickstarter to crowdfund this project, which I don't really understand. They're a massive company that can easily bring stuff like this into production, and it seems like the hardware is already production ready, so I guess they're just using crowdfunding to try to feel out the market a little bit, but to me it just seems a bit silly and I prefer they just bring a complete product to market. But that's not the case, and they are using Kickstarter with some early bird pricing, so it is what it is. Also, the Kickstarter pricing is potentially really good, and so A, I don't want you guys spending money on a product that might suck even though the price is really low, and also B, I don't want you guys to miss out potentially if the product is amazing and you can get it for a really good price. So I felt like this was worth covering even though technically it is in a crowdfunding stage. Also, it looks like right now you can just do a $5 deposit to guarantee your early bird pricing without actually buying one, so it may be worth checking that out. I also want to be completely transparent and mention that I have worked with Ugreen in the past as a sponsor, and I'm technically still in a contract for a few more integrated advertisements. However, this is not an advertisement, they didn't send me any money, they just sent me the product to review and give my honest opinions on. That being said, I realize there's a bit of a conflict of interest here, and I completely understand if you don't want to fully trust me. Actually, I haven't watched it, but it looks like Naz Compares did a really long, in-depth review on this that I'd highly encourage you to go check out as well. The unit Ugreen sent me is the DXP4800 Plus. This features the Intel Pentium Gold 8505, a 5-core CPU, which is a bit interesting. It has 4 efficiency cores and 1 performance core, which has hyper-threading, so in total it has 6 threads, and has a base TDP of 15 watts, and a max turbo frequency of 4.4 GHz. And at least at the time of filming this video, the CPU kind of seems like a weird choice, but more on that a bit later on. The system comes with 8GB of DDR5 that can be upgraded all the way to 64GB, which is pretty sweet. 
It also has an internal 128 GB NVMe SSD for the operating system, and then obviously four hot swappable 3.5 inch drive bays, as well as two M.2 slots for NVMe SSDs in this compartment on the bottom. For the price point, the I.O. is pretty generous on this thing. On the front, there are two 10 gigabit per second USB ports, with one being Type A and the other being Type C, as well as an SD card reader, which is actually a pretty handy thing to have on the front of a NAS, at least for certain people. On the back, there's an HDMI port, 5 gigabit per second USB Type A port, two USB Type 2 ports, a 2.5 gigabit NIC, and then the best part is the inclusion of a 10 gigabit NIC, which I found to also have no issues with 1 gigabit or 2.5 gigabit. And there's also the DC barrel jack for the external power supply. There's also this really nice magnetic dust cover for the 140mm system fan. Now one thing I actually found that's pretty interesting is most NAS systems similar to this have a fan on the back that's an exhaust, but this fan actually is an intake and forces air through the NAS out the front through the gaps between the drive trays. Speaking of the hard drive trays, while they do feel pretty cheap and flimsy, they actually worked really well. I had no problems with them supporting the drives, and because of this cool latching clamping mechanism, it made drive swaps super quick. Honestly, I would not be surprised to see this functionality on other drive trays in the future. Overall, the build quality looks and feels amazing. There really isn't much to complain about, unless you try to open this thing up, but I'll cover that in another section. Now you probably noticed that there are other models in the lineup that might make more or less sense for you. For example, one cool thing I noticed was that the larger models support PCIe expansion and have dual 10 gigabit NICs. Also, the cheaper models have eMMC storage instead of an SSD, and I'm curious if that's actually soldered to the motherboard, or if it's in an M.2 format that could be upgraded to an NVMe SSD. But at least for my model, that pretty much covers the hardware, at least the basics. Let's start talking about the software and the user experience. Now it's really funny because it seemed like Ugreen initially really wanted to get these videos out quickly, but about a day into my testing I got an email with them basically saying like, hey, uh, the software doesn't really seem to be where we want it to be, so could you push the video back a little bit until we can send out an update? And I was like, yeah, fair enough. So I, I did a little bit of testing, but then I stopped and waited until they sent a firmware update. However, I did initially set my system up with the original software, so I'll at least show that bit and then I'll show the update and everything on from there. As instructed, I went to find.ugnas.com and my NAS popped up with no issues. Now, to be fair, this software is in beta, and this sign-up process was before they sent out the updates, but overall the software is a bit rough around the edges, and basically the first page started showing some pretty early warning signs of that. At one point in the setup, I was prompted to set up my phone, but that just wouldn't work no matter how many times I tried, and when I tried refreshing the page, it just skipped the rest of the setup process and took me to the login page, so hopefully I didn't miss anything important. The web UI is very reminiscent of other UIs, where you essentially have a desktop and a taskbar at the top, and so on. It looked nice for the most part, but there were definitely some unpolished bits. For example, the fonts. Some areas had a modern sans serif, but then all of a sudden you were met with a serif font that looked like it belonged on a law firm website or something. This is obviously not a serious issue, but it was a bit jarring, and also just gave the impression that this software wasn't completely put together yet. When setting up a pool and volumes, the recommendations and descriptions were actually pretty solid, and I had no issues setting up my drives in RAID 10. Although I did find it funny that it told me my drives weren't supported when I used the drives that Ugreen sent me, so yeah. Other than that, it was a smooth process and I had no issues getting my pool and volume created. I set up SMB shares without any issues, but when I enabled the service, I noticed that the fans really ramped up for the first time. I imagine this will be able to be fixed somewhat in a firmware update or something like that, but I did notice pretty often that the system would just be dead quiet, and then all of a sudden ramp up to what sounded like 100%, and then ramp right back down to just being dead silent. This might not be an issue if you're storing this off in a closet or something, but if it's going to be in your office, it's definitely noticeable. SMB shares worked fine though, and performance was fairly flawless over a 2.5 gigabit connection. And that was basically everything I did in the original version of the software, and then I got the email asking to wait until the update. And after about a week or so, they emailed saying that the update was ready, and all I had to do was go into the settings and the update tab, and it was there, and I updated with no problems. Well, other than the fact that the UI stopped updating unless I did a refresh, which was not a serious issue but still just a little bit clunky. 
Now I'm sure that the software update they sent out did fix a lot of bugs, but it didn't really fix a lot of the things I was noticing, and it definitely didn't add a lot of features. For example, if you go to the App Center, there's not a lot going on. Now in some ways I'm glad there's not just a whole bunch of junk first party apps that I would never use, but it would have been nice to see something here other than just very basic NAS functions. I guess in some ways this could be nice because it could be showing that they're trying to polish the basics before moving on to a bunch of other features. But still, there really wasn't a lot here. One big disappointment I found was that there's no support for running Docker containers or virtual machines. Now this is supposed to come later down the road according to some email correspondence with my rep from Ugreen, and I really hope so because otherwise this nicer CPU really doesn't have anything to do because it's complete overkill for just basic NAS stuff. Now obviously with the NAS you want to be able to do backups, so I installed the Backup and Sync app. The Sync tab took forever to load, and then initially only had one option to sync with another Ugreen NAS, at least for the moment. In the Backup tab, I tried setting up an rsync backup to my TrueNAS server. One quirk I found that kind of made me giggle was this drop down menu for the retention policy where there was only one option of retain latest version. rsync did take a long time to back up, but it did work. While it was backing up, I installed the desktop app which is basically just another web browser, and doesn't seem to offer much more functionality than that, which is a bit disappointing. Well, it did bring up one new option. In the backup tab, there was now the option to sync a folder from my desktop to the Ugreen NAS. The default backup policy option was to backup after file change, and this was really good. Any changes I made in the synced folder were basically noticed immediately and backed up to the NAS. This actually did seem fairly polished and worked pretty well, and could make this NAS a good option for backing up multiple desktop PCs for example, so credit where credit's due. The only app in the App Center that wasn't for like basic NAS functionality was the Photos app, and I decided to give that a try. I was initially prompted to set up a personal folder, which I assumed was just going to be the home folder for my user, but those are two different things. Maybe I'm dumb, but I don't entirely understand why there's a difference. Anyway, I made a personal folder, and then uploaded some photos. These showed up in the app and I could organize them, put them into albums, and it all worked fairly smoothly. One thing that I did find annoying was that if you organized your photos into different directories, that didn't correlate with albums in the app. You still have to manually go into the app and put those into albums, which is a little bit disappointing. While messing around with the Photos app, I got some more experience with the in-browser file manager, and in some ways it works pretty well, but it definitely isn't the most user-friendly or intuitive at times. For example, you can't drag and drop files, and overall it just feels a bit clunky and unfinished. I'd probably give them more of a break here if it wasn't for the fact that my Synology DS215+, Plus, which is almost a decade old and is running an older version of DSM, has a much more fluid file manager, not to mention plenty of other software features. Up until this point, I'd only been using 2.5 gig networking, so I hooked up the 10 gig NIC to my 10 gig switch, and it worked just about as well as you could expect with four spinning disks. To try to get a little bit more performance out of that 10 gig connection, I decided to drop in two NVMe SSDs to use for caching, and I was able to set these up in a mirrored array and use them as a read-write cache. Another minor quirk I ran into was that when setting these up, there's a required capacity field, which apparently needs to be no more than 80% of the array's capacity but it wouldn't just do that math for you, so I actually had to break out a calculator to find what 80% was of the total storage. So yeah, I'm being a bit nitpicky, but you're already having to generate that 80% value so you can generate the error message, so why not just plug that value in as the default text in the field? Nitpicky, but kind of also annoying. Also, the instructions were a bit unclear here as to what fixed better FS metadata even is, so I just went with no, which was the default. I don't really know much about better FS and caching within it, so I might be missing something here, but performance was sometimes noticeably better, but at other times the same or even worse. I also tested upgrading the RAM from 8GB to 32GB of DDR5, and this actually made the most noticeable improvement. Once again, I don't know much about better FS, but it seems to do a good job of utilizing memory for caching. So if you do end up getting one of these, I think my recommendation would just be to upgrade to 64 gigs of RAM before worrying about getting any NVMe SSDs, at least not for caching. I think probably the worst thing though that I found in the software was that I couldn't find a way to set up email notifications for if a drive failed, for example. The closest thing I could find seemed to be in the Log Center app, but that only seemed to work for notifications in the web UI. I even tested this out by removing drives, and the notifications in the UI worked, but still no email. Now maybe I would have gotten text notifications if the initial text setup also worked, but I also couldn't find anywhere in the settings to fix that after the setup, so I guess I'll never know. 
Now to be clear, if I have missed something, and especially if Ugreen points it out, I will make sure to put that correction down in the description, so maybe go check that out just in case I do miss something or get something wrong. So overall, Ugreen OS seems to be pretty rough around the edges, but at least for the basics, everything kind of worked, even if at times I didn't feel like it was going to. That being said, there are still a lot of features missing, like for example, being able to run Docker containers, and that's supposed to be coming down the road, but I don't have a crystal ball and can only review the software I have. And the software I have comes with typos, font mismatches, a UI that locks up every now and then, menus with one option, a stay logged in feature that I forgot to mention doesn't work apparently, and also every time I log in I have to accept the EULA. Every single time I log in, I have to accept the EULA. Why? Anyway, Ugreen OS is definitely not polished and lacking in features, but why not just use something else? Well, about that. From what I understand through email correspondence with my rep at Ugreen, they are not going to honor warranties if you install a third-party OS. Actually, no, that actually changed since I originally filmed this video, but I'll talk more about that towards the end. For now, let's get back to installing a different operating system. While you do have access to the two SSDs and RAM on the bottom, you don't have access to the actual boot drive. To get to that, you have to tear this thing open. To do that, you'll have to remove these four rubber screw covers, and then the four screws to take off the back panel. Then you'll remove four more screws to remove the fan, and at this point you'll come across a warranty void if removed sticker. Now in the past when I've talked about warranty stickers, I've had people get really upset and point out that those are illegal in the US and the company can't void your warranty for cutting that sticker, and yeah, that's technically true. But in reality, if Ugreen just decides to not repair or replace your product when it dies because you peeled off that sticker, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to take them to court? Because I doubt it, because they're a massive company and they're not even US based, which is, it's, it's going to be a mess. So I talk about this because I want to make sure you guys know what you're getting into and also call out Ugreen for doing things that I think are stupid. It's really frustrating, but it seems like, at least for now, that's what Ugreen wants to do. And what I want to do is open up this NAS. So after voiding my warranty, I had to remove eight more screws to get these little brackets off, and then the outer chassis slid off. Now annoyingly, the boot drive is right next to the other M.2 sockets that you do have access to, but to get to the boot drive, you have to take out all of these screws. It's really frustrating. Anyway, I dropped in a new SSD and plan to install TrueNAS. First, I wanted to get into the BIOS though, and this is, once again, kind of annoying. It seems like they disabled the shortcut to get to the BIOS settings, so the only way to force the BIOS settings to show up is to not have any sort of bootable media. Once again, that might not be the biggest issue, but considering you have to remove all of these screws to take out that SSD, it's kind of a pain. The BIOS is pretty straightforward, but doesn't have a ton of options. For example, there's no option to enable Intel Virtualization or IOMMU, so hopefully those are just enabled by default. But some basic options were there, like being able to disable Turbo Boost, and boot options, which let me select to boot from USB first. After that, I plugged in a TrueNAS installer, but the system just kept shutting down after a few minutes. I started to get a little bit nervous thinking Ugreen was getting really aggressive at stopping people from using third-party software, but it turns out it was actually working as expected, because Watchdog was enabled. Watchdog is a feature that's enabled in the BIOS by default, and it's actually there to make sure if the NAS operating system crashes, the system will automatically reboot itself. But if you're trying to install an operating system and don't plan on using Watchdog, you'll need to disable it so you don't just keep rebooting the system. Also, shout out to another YouTuber, a Chairleg, one of my favorite YouTubers to watch, because he got me all squared away on this Watchdog thing because he hit it first and made sure I didn't have to email and wait for an email from Ugreen. So thanks, man. With all of that out of the way, I did get TrueNAS installed without any issues, and it worked great. I was able to use both NICs without any issues, I was able to add two more SSDs again to have some flash media, and it just, it just worked. I also installed Proxmox to test out some virtualization, and it seems those missing settings in the BIOS weren't a problem at all. I had no issues setting up a virtual machine, which I actually decided on TrueNAS scale, that way I could test out PCIe pass-through with the 10 gig NIC and SATA controller and that all worked without any issues. I also quickly set up an LXC container to run COS OS and primarily Jellyfin to test out some hardware accelerated transcoding. Now, the results here weren't incredible, but they were still fairly solid. I was able to get around 60 frames per second or so when transcoding both 4K 10-bit H.264 and H.265. I also had no issues enabling VPP tone mapping for HDR. After that, I installed Windows because, well, why not? 
I did have driver issues with both of the NICs here and ended up having to use a USB adapter, but if you're buying this, you're probably not installing Windows, so that shouldn't be an issue. Realistically, I pretty much only installed Windows to quickly run Cinebench. That way I could get a rough ballpark idea of CPU performance and compare it to the N100 that's on the cheaper models. Now, obviously I don't have any of those cheaper models, but I do have the results from this Camry mini PC with an N100. Obviously this isn't a direct comparison, but should give a rough idea of how these two CPUs stack up. As you can see in both the multi-threaded and single-threaded tests, the Pentium Gold 8505 completely outclasses the N100. This is great if you actually need that CPU horsepower, but the power draw is going to be a different story. Now, once again, I don't have those other NAS models, so I really can't make a good comparison here of system power draw. But at idle in Windows with no hard drives, the system sat at around 23 watts. When running Cinebench, the system initially jumped up to around 55 watts, and then once Turbo Boost died down, it settled to 45 watts. Without the other models on hand, I really can't make a good comparison, but I do imagine the M100 systems will draw at least a little bit less power. I also didn't mention it earlier, but in Ugreen OS, the system idled at around 25 watts without any drives in the system. That jumped up to around 35 watts when the disks were spun down, and then it jumped to around 45 watts while actually writing files to the NAS. Also, while running Cinebench, I noticed that the CPU was hitting core temps of 100 degrees Celsius, which is actually its junction temperature but this did drop down to the low 80s once the CPU throttled down. I honestly don't know quite how dangerous this is or could be, but if you want to be safe, you could disable the turbo boost setting in the BIOS like I mentioned earlier, and I imagine that would keep temps from spiking up like that. I'm really not sure if this is intended behavior or something that may or may not be able to be fixed in a future BIOS update or something. So that's pretty much it. That was my testing. What are my thoughts on this thing? Alright guys, so it's been a few days since I filmed that last little bit, and I've since talked to you, Green, and some things have sort of changed, so I just cut everything that I'd already filmed and edited for the end of this video, and I'm just going to wrap things up here. So the first thing I want to talk about is the warranty support and coverage, particularly if you want to install a third-party operating system. It seems that originally they just completely didn't want to support this, but then after some pushback, they sent out a response that, in my opinion, wasn't super clear. It says the Ugreen team confirms that whatever is promised in their warranty policy will not change, which only covers the hardware. And then they also went on to clarify that there's a risk when using other software that may include data loss and incompatibility issues, which, you know, fair enough. But their phrasing on the warranty was a little bit vague and to me didn't sound like a clear yes, if you install a third party operating system, but the hardware fails, we'll still cover the hardware. And so I asked for some clarity on this, and after some back and forth, I was able to get them to give me a little bit better response, which I'll read here. The Ugreen team confirms that whatever is promised in their warranty policy will not change, which only covers the hardware, regardless of software that is installed on the system. This is much better, and it seems like based off of this, they would replace or repair your hardware if you had, you know, a defect or, or something like that, even if you were running TrueNAS or whatever. But it's, it's still a little bit more vague than I would have appreciated. I think they're really trying to make it clear that this is not something that they support or recommend, and it's not how they want you to use their product. But it seems like at least they, they will cover hardware issues regardless of, of software. So I'm still a little hesitant to recommend this because it's not as clear as I, I would like especially if you're wanting to potentially run third-party software, which you might want to because while the software, in fairness, does work for the most part, it's still nowhere near what the competition can offer. Obviously, it's still in beta and they seem pretty confident that they're going to improve on it quite a bit and add more features, but I have the software I have and I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't say that the software is going to be good. I can only review the software I have and it was their decision to ship this unit out with the current software, and clearly they wanted videos to be made to drive some hype around this launch, so if the software is where it's at, that's, that's what I have to review. And right now, it's not great. I will say that when I was editing, I actually had to cut out quite a bit of my script because a lot of the issues I did have, I noticed, ended up getting fixed in a later update. So credit for that, and it seems like they're on a decent track, and it seems like there's continued improvement, but once again, I can't say that it's going to be good software in a month or three months or six months or a year. So once again, I'm still kind of hesitant to recommend this, as is considering they officially don't support any other software. That being said, if you're the type of person that really doesn't care about the warranty, doesn't care about Ugreen OS, and you just want to buy this for the hardware and install whatever you want, the hardware is pretty good. For similar prices as other 4-bay models on the market, you're getting a lot of features from 10 gigabit NICs and the three NVMe slots, I guess, 
and easily upgradable DDR5, and not to mention a CPU that's much more overpowered than pretty much any other four bay NAS you'd find out there. It's, it's pretty compelling hardware. If you're looking to have sort of an all-in-one solution with network attached storage, but also run some virtual machines and containers, this makes a great little Proxmox box, as long as you don't mind doing a little bit of tinkering. So yeah, overall, the hardware is really good. The software is kind of rough, but it does show some promise. I just wouldn't invest a ton of money banking on the software improving. If you're the type of person that wants to use Ugreen OS and use this as intended, as good as the Kickstarter pricing is, I would probably hold off. Maybe look into the $5 deposit to you know get your early bird pricing, but I would definitely wait and see how the software develops. If you're the type of person that doesn't care about Ugreen OS and really doesn't care about support and that sort of thing, it's really good hardware and might be worth checking out. But I'm curious to know what you guys think. Obviously you don't have one of these to look at, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on the hardware and the software and the state of it currently. Let me know down in the comments below. And almost more importantly, let you green know, because in my opinion, this is a review for you guys, but it's also sort of a review for them so they can hopefully make a better product and have a better service that they can bring to market, which is beneficial for all of us. So I think that's about it for this one. So as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.